My first guest tonight is one of the most respected broadcasters in the country. Robert Peston is one of Britain's most influential and popular journalists. Starting his career in the world of economics before moving into political correspondence, he became notorious for his dry wit. That word crisis might be an understatement. Impartial and forthright interview style. I don't know why you're continuing to treat this as a sort of matter of hilarity. It's actually, not hilarity, it's actually, worry. Resulting in his own flagship show for ITV. Now he's exploring the world of fiction with his debut novel, The Whistleblower. Please welcome Robert Pester! We'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that. We're still in the grip of it, aren't we? We are. We are. It's funny, because whenever I, I, I see you, I, I instantly think of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I spent 18 months... It's so odd to see you here, because we're used to seeing you like this. That's how we oh used to... Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> Me at my most lunatic, yeah, absolutely. And, and then what blew my mind is the other day I was flicking through a newspaper and I saw you like this. <laughs> I mean, that is an extraordinary look. What was behind that? The Times very sweetly said they wanted to interview me. Yeah. And then they said they wanted to do a photo shoot. Uh, so I uh, traipsed down to the studio. Uh, they started asking me to put some costumes on. <laughs> and I... Hang on, and costumes? They, and they were very... <laughs> <laughs> Just, well, what do you think that is? I don't yeah. Know. I feel it, it was a sort of Miami Vice look, wasn't it, really? I... And uh, obviously they were channelling the inner me. Um, <laughs> but what I was intrigued, what I thought was, was that the way you normally dress? and you feel like you have to tone down your magnificence. <laughs> because I'd like to see you on the news dressed like you've had a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I sort of think that, given the year and a half we've had, I yeah. probably do owe the nation that. I was going to ask, um, what was it like dur during the, the pandemic? Did you feel a kind of a sense of responsibility Particularly those early days, we were glued to what was going on. It was certainly the most stressful story I've ever covered. I bet, um, yeah. uh, if if you're, you know, covering a big event, you, you do, you know, you, it is tense mm. because it was quite easy for people to find me, and you know, I, I, the the lots and lots of people were getting in touch about how terrified they were. Mm. You know, they were terrified of the illness, uh, understandably. They weren't getting supported by... At that point, it was almost impossible to get any advice from, you know, uh, the NHS, you know, and, 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 and then there were just an astonishing number of people who couldn't work, couldn't get through um, to Social Security to get universal credit. You know, they would, you know, um, there was, you know there, was particular, there was one guy in particular who sent me a, 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 an email saying he was going to kill himself because he'd run out of money, he'd run out of food. He'd been on the phone to try and get universal credit for an entire day. Nobody had picked it up. Um, and you feel, in those circumstances, a wholly different kind of responsibility for how you normally feel as a journalist. You can't ignore people like that. Yeah. So actually what I did, I actually rang up the relevant minister and I just said, look, you know, this person, you know, you know, is in real trouble. And actually, all credit to this minister, she put me in touch with an official, I gave him the number, he gave him the guy's number, and the guy got the money. Um, and, and, but and there were, this was just like one of many stories. All I'm trying to say is, when real people are suffering like this, it, it does actually bring a degree of... Um, it just raises massively the stakes yeah. uh, as, as a journalist. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, poor me, because let's be absolutely clear, I absolutely adore what I do for a living. And, you know, I actually, it was actually a privilege that people wanted to get in touch. And it was a privileged feeling that, in some cases, I was able to help them. So this is... But, but it does bring... You can't... It means you have to look at every email in your inbox. Yeah. And if, if one, you know... And, if, you know, and of course, there are lots of nutters, as well as people who really, you know, are telling you something that matters. Yeah. Wow, Jesus, that is some responsibility. And not only were you covering COVID, um, you managed to write a book. And it's your first work of... Of fiction. Yeah, it's a thriller, yeah. What's it about? So, The Whistleblower is about a uh, very driven journalist in 1997. It's just before the election. His sister uh, dies, actually, in a bicycle accident. He thinks it's an accident. And then he, begin that he, he begins uh, to get information from sources that indicate that maybe she was murdered. And the book is really uh, a thriller about trying to find the guilty individuals who happen 
to be some very powerful and bad people at the top of politics and business. There's lots of fascinating um, sort of parallels between your life and the, uh, the main character, uh, Gil Peck. Yes, I mean, what I tried to do with all the characters in the book is write about um, either people I had observed or things that I'd experienced. And so the, the central character, Gil Peck, he is this journalist. And, uh, you know, it, he was doing, he in the book is doing a job that actually was pretty similar to the job I did. Uh, well, that's at, that, at, 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 at that era, and there are certain things about him which, which are very similar to me. So yes. I'm, a, you know, I was an absolutely obsessive person when it came to pursuing a story. I also, sort of, slightly connected to that is I suffered quite badly from obsessive compulsive disorder. This. You know, uh, idea. I was constantly, you know, when I was a kid, I was doing things like constantly checking the gas was off, uh, the doors were locked. I'd get up, literally, you know, as a sort of teenager, I'd get up at sort of four in the morning and do these, do this. I'd be in a state of sort of high anxiety, and then subsequently, just had lots of when I was anxious, I had lots of sort of rituals, chanting things to sort of calm myself down in a a, a, a way that actually was quite um, debilitating in a way. Yeah, it stops you getting on with your life in some some ways. And he has he has that. Um, so there are there are things there are things that are like me and there are also things that are not me. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I imagine you're going to pick up on some of those things. Well, he's a massive drug hound. Um, and so, <laughs> so it is true that he self-medicates with. You know, he's also yeah. got ADHD and he sure. sort of medicates with, uh, you know, cocaine and alcohol. And that isn't me. Uh, that is although, I, although let's be clear, that is based on, you know, I do know people who were like that then. Yes. And again, it was, this is based on stuff that, you know, I very much observed. And your, your wife is, is an author, isn't she? Yeah, my partner Charlotte Edwards, uh, she's, a, uh, she, she, well, she's a journalist, she writes a lot for the Times. Yeah. Uh, but she's also a brilliant, she's a much better writer, she's much more accomplished writer than I am. She's just um, actually finishing her first. Uh, novel and uh, so when it was finished, she was one of the rare number of rare people who, who were allowed to to see it. And my thank goodness she did because she was able. You know, so what, what, one of the slight problems with writing a book in a hurry uh, <laughs> is is you leave some fairly clunky metaphors in. And so she said she she basically said if I didn't take the various things out, she'd never speak to me again. So <laughs> <laughs> what kind of things? What we're dealing with? Um, I described. Um, for some reason or other, I decided to describe this character's nipples. And, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Charlotte basically <laughs> said that, you know, if that stayed in the book, I could forget about anybody doing a serious review because all they would write about <laughs> was uh, this the particular hilariously, uh, hilariously uh, silly description. So how were you describing the nipples? Like, what um, <laughs> we're talking so otter's, otter's nose? I have slightly... Sorry again? Otter's nose? <laughs> That, 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 that would have been more creative. Um, <laughs> what did you go um, for? It was, it, was, it was in the territory of, you know, <laughs> of, of being like... <laughs> Um, I've never I'm quite, seen I'm quite, you I'm, I'm, quite, I'm, I'm not easy to embarrass, but I, mean, I actually... Yeah, I know. But, uh, so, no, it was in the territory of uh, fingers. Nipples like fingers. So, nipples like fingers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what I would say... In your defence, if somebody had nipples like fingers, that would be the first thing that you would think of when you describe that person. <laughs> if you were like, yeah, geez, Jeff looks like he's always out in the Yeah, court. so we're not going to go back and explore yeah, sure. where in my past I encountered somebody like that. Right. But, but, uh, but there was somebody like that many, 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 many years ago, and I hope to goodness they're not watching this programme. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for my guest, the wonderful Robert Peston! <laughs>